Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you to the second day of the public information gathering session, paving the way for continental scale biology, connecting research cross scales. For those who are not here yesterday, I would like to mention that this is a, a organized effort under the auspices of the Consensus Study Committee of the National Academies on research at multiple scale, a vision for continental scale biology. I'm Jack Liu, the committee chair. I'll begin to acknowledge the wonderful committee members and staff, uh, outstanding staff members of the National Academies for their great help in planning this webinar. Yesterday, we had a keynote presentation and also six other presentations by leading researchers from the US, Germany, and Sweden. The excellent speakers covered a wide range of topics, highlight uh, progress that had been made in the uh, last several decades, and um, such as the integration of two grand challenges of our time, global change and biodiversity loss. Also um, talked about the golden age of remote sensing, the power of remote sensing data used to generate information and useful knowledge across multiple scale. Also talked about the golden age of genomics and, um, and the integration of um, microbiology, epidemiology, and uh, biogeography through citizen science approaches. And also explore a lot of other issues, such as the drivers of uh, biodiversity with neon data and the patterns of change in biodiversity under globalization and urbanization. And of course, they also point out a lot of challenges and limitations, especially data availability and the lack of synthesis of existing data. Of course, the funding is always an issue and not just the uh, lack of funding for some areas, but not long enough funding to ensure the data maintenance and the data use and uh, um, integration. And then the speakers also point out a number of needs or solutions and uh, to, to fill out sample gaps in many regions and uh, more innovative use of artificial intelligence and other tools. And also talk about the, the um, resource networks and networks of networks of ideas, people, and the infrastructures and the more integrated theories, right? So there are a lot of other issues uh, discussed and uh, yesterday. And due to the time limitation, I will not go through all this for those who are interested in they can watch the video. And um, so this uh, uh, webinar is being recorded. Also, today we will hear another keynote presentation and several other presentations by uh, experienced uh, program manager at several federal agencies supporting research across multiple scales. Following the presentation, and we will take questions from both the committee and participants joining us via live stream. If you are audience members joining us via live stream, please submit questions through Slido. And you can also upload the questions from the audience you like most to uh, hear. And uh, we encourage questions from the audience, but the question from the committee will be uh, prioritized. And uh, after the meeting, anyone would like to submit the written comments and uh, could uh, contact Cliff, the study director, or provide feedback through the website of the project of the, uh, the National Academy of Sciences. Now I would like to invite uh, Stephanie, one of our wonderful committee members, to moderate the next panel presentation. Stephanie. Thank you, Thank you Jack, and thanks so much, Sai. It was a really, it was a great talk. Um, so I'm, I'm, 
I'm going to introduce the, the panel discussion that, that we have uh, this afternoon, uh, biology at multiple scales from the program manager's perspectives. So um, as we're uh, diving into the work of this committee, we recognize that program managers across our, our agencies frequently you're really seeing the leading edge of research and you're also seeing what's not being proposed um, that you feel that there's a, a need for. So we wanted to invite you here to sort of give us that that real overview of this landscape. And of course, uh, in many cases, you're you're managing funding programs. Uh, you also have uh, some of you have uh, teams of researchers that that work within your agencies. And so uh, you really bring that breadth of perspectives and we appreciate you being here. So um, the panelists will have a total of 10 minutes each and um, are, are gonna try to limit their, their comments to about eight minutes with a few minutes for questions in between if we can, if we can stay roughly on time. All right, so um, you have the uh, the bios for each of the speakers. And so I don't want to take away from their time by uh, giving them a really lengthy introduction. So I'll just uh, briefly say first, we're going to hear from Annika Gerlinga from National Institutes of Health. Um, and Annika is a program officer in the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences in uh, NIH. And so she will tell us more about the uh, this program and, and uh, perspective from NIH. Annika? Excellent, thank you. All right, uh, thanks so much for the introduction. And I'm happy to be here to tell you a bit about what we have going on at the NIEHS. Next slide. Um, just to orient you, the National Institutes of Health is made up of 27 institutes and centers, of which NIEHS is just one, but carries a broad scope of work. Uniquely, NIEHS is not focused on any one health outcome, but is concerned with understanding the role of environment in driving disease outcomes with an overall mission of improving human health or preventing disease. For this presentation, I hope to cover the challenges in defining environment in the context of specific research questions, how our research by definition places us at the nexus of multiple disciplines, and stress the overall need for clear synergy and collaboration with other funding agencies. Next slide. So most of this presentation will be through the lens of having overseen a portfolio of research awards related to the intersection of host microbiome, environmental exposures, and human health. So typically for NIEHS, environmental exposure refers to a chemical exposure or natural toxin that one encounters in life and can be ingested through food or water, inhaled or dermal exposure at many doses for any length of time. Our approach to the role of the microbiome has been several fold. Um, it could be in and of itself a direct target of a chemical which mediates disease progression in some way. Taking the gut microbiome as an example, an exposure may elicit toxicity of microbes directly to impact the health of the GI tract, or it may alter the profile of microbial products which go on to communicate with other systems throughout the body, such as through the gut liver or gut brain axes. And interpretation is heavily context dependent as there are direct impacts of microbes on the host to influence health irrespective of chemical interactions. And that can drive the quote unquote normal physiology. In some cases, the host microbiome contributes to biotransformation processes that render that exogenous chemical we're studying more or less toxic in its metabolite form. Thus, in that case, the microbiome could be considered a mediator of bioelimination, which is still crucial to understanding the overall process of toxicity for that exposure. It's important to point out in the overall framing of the NIEHS mission, the microbiome is not considered to be an environmental exposure, but we examine the host microbiome as an additional organ system. However, 
as a research field broader than NIEHS, it's important not to lose sight of the fact that the microbiome, both environmental and in various niches within the host, are microenvironments in their own right with their own interactions and communication systems, but often underappreciated in this space just for the sake of designing a tighter study. So if we take this paradigm and look at the larger context of human health, um, in the schematic on the right, you can see that viewing host microbiome as one of many sources of individual variability is critical to addressing the applications. So can microbial signatures predict toxicity, leave a fingerprint of exposure, or be the key to preventing or mitigating exposure-related toxicities? Okay, uh, next slide. So as an example of the complex interplay I just described, here's a schematic of the contribution of air pollutants to metabolic disorders. Firstly, air pollution is a complex mixture in and of itself with each type of particle boasting a unique toxicology profile and attributions. Secondly, there are direct impacts of pollutants on biological systems, which we know from animal and human studies. So this can come both from inhaled and ingested routes, contributing to outcomes in the lung and the gut and beyond. In this schematic, the author describes multiple roles for the microbiome in facilitating this, including altered biotransformation of toxicants and changes in the microbiota composition and metabolites, contributing to those secondary and tertiary effects. So in all, although I don't have time for multiple examples, I'm hoping that this slide conveys that elucidation of these pathways necessitates mechanistic biology, exposure science, and epidemiology approaches as each contributes a unique set of answers. Next slide. As alluded to on a previous slide, NIEHS needs to be somewhat specific in its definition of the environment when developing certain programs as it can be unwieldy and lofty to consider everything, but that doesn't mean that it should not be a goal. Um, though it's not my program per se, I want to highlight the concept of the exposome because I think it's relevant to the goals of this meeting. So I've borrowed a couple slides from my colleague Yusha Sue, who recently presented an update to our NAEHS Council in January about exposomics. Essentially, the exposome represents the combined exposures from all sources that reach the internal chemical environment and may influence human health. So uh, on this slide is a probably non-exhaustive list of sources of exposures from various environments that may influence internal systems. And this notably goes above and beyond that chemical toxicant or natural toxin definition that I said earlier. Next slide. So uh, this second exposome slide is a schematic indicating the paradigm approaches and challenges for exposure science in the exposome. Basically, how do we track external exposure from the source into, um, into a host and into the biological systems within the, within the host and key in on relevant biological processes that are integral to health outcomes. So this involves leveraging tools and technologies that are already in place, either within our discipline or without and developing integration approaches from determining overall exposure at say a geospatial level to individual or population level and taking an intentional look at which analyses are going to be the most powerful tools in determining exposure disease relationship. So with the direction of human microbiome work, moving toward leveraging more function-based applications such as microbial metabolomics or metatranscriptomics. I see an important role for microbiome here, especially when one considers what we can learn from the environmental microbiome and translate it into a human microbiome context. Uh, next slide. Okay, although I am most certainly running out of time um, in this last slide, I would be remiss not to include a successful example we have of a program that successfully merges environmental science with health sciences, and that is the NIEHS NSF co-funded Centers for Oceans and Human Health. So this is a 20-year collaboration to jointly fund marine-related health research. The structure of the centers are three to four distinct research projects, a community engagement core, and an administrative core. At least one research project addresses a biomedical question, one addresses oceanography or lacustrine-related question, and one research project examines the role of climate change. And then community partners are engaged to facilitate translation of data into policy, dissemination of community-level education, or prevention and mitigation strategies. Um, just importantly, the center structure allows for scientists from distinct disciplines to engage their multifaceted tools and approaches 
to coherently tackle major environmental and health concerns. Um, next slide. So that's a very brief tour that I prepared to start this conversation and I'd be happy to take questions now or in the panel. Thank you. Uh, that's great, Hanukkah. Thank, Thank you so much. Um, I think that we have time for uh, one question. And I'm looking around. I see Janine. Janine, are you looking for your? Yeah, okay. sorry. My audio, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So, um, in the One Health slide you just showed, um, I see that climate change is emphasized. But we also saw with the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, that there are all these links um, to natural ecosystems and to biodiversity. And I'm wondering if there is consideration on increasingly incorporating biodiversity into the One Health paradigm. Uh, I mean, I can't speak on behalf of all agencies involved in the One Health paradigm, but certainly, yeah, that's a conversation that's that's being had. Um, especially, I was teasing a little bit about what what are we looking at in terms of environmental microbiome or the environment in the grand scheme of the conversation of the environment. And I think talking more and more about climate change that ha has been and needs to be part of the conversation. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Annika. So I think we should go ahead and um, move to our next panelist. So our next panelist is uh, Katerina Dittmar from National Science Foundation. And um, I don't actually have to look at her bio to be able to introduce her. I probably, uh, uh, although it would help uh, me to see the great number of programs she's been involved with, but uh, specifically she is um, uh, working with ecology and evolution of infectious disease, which is also a multi-agency program, uh, predictive intelligence for pandemic prevention, and, um, and a really large number of other programs. So um, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you, Katerina. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here and thanks for inviting me. I don't have any slides, so I'm just gonna uh, talk and you're just gonna have to look at me and listen. Um, so in the past years, NSF has uh, stood up various programs that are aimed at translating knowledge across scales, but I will focus my remarks on the context of fundamental infectious disease research. Um, now, we all just went through a pandemic and a lot of the research in the infectious disease arena suddenly became science with a deadline. And those moments of crisis are always great to realize all the things that are missing, not working, and that we should have taken care of ages ago. Um, so one of the edges in terms of research that emerged early on uh, at, in the pandemic stage uh, relates to a particular point in the pandemic timeline which we call the pre-emergence stage. And the broader context here is essentially the prediction of rare events in multi-scale complex dynamical systems. And predicting the dynamics of such systems is of course extremely complex. And uh, we are seeing some uh, increased attention to the development of innovative theoretical frameworks and modeling tools that aim to capture nonlinear complexity. There's also a recognition that in order to operationalize these models, we need not just any data, but the right data. And ideally this should be data at optimal granularity, meaning it should be relevant to the temporal and spatial scales in question. Um, in the particular context of the pre-emergent state of pandemics, um, this predictive framework should be informed by biosurveillance as a very necessary ground truthing step, together with the integration of climate, land use, um, and other often remotely collected large scale data sets that can inform future scenarios of emergence or vulnerabilities and risks to animals, plants, the ecosystem, the environment with large or human populations. 
Um, of course, we all know there are millions of pathogens or microbes that have yet to be discovered. And in the face of this high and ever evolving biodiversity, it became clear that uh, surveillance of emerging, uh, emerging threats is needed at a scale that is currently impractical with the existing technology. So to address this need for new technology, there is an increased interest in the research community that we are observing on our end uh, to design wireless remotely operated sensor networks combined with new sensors for rapid detection to enable identification of pathogens. Another area of activity and growth we have seen is what could be described as a spatial temporal dynamics of pathogen dispersal in the context of different environments and climate processes. Essentially, this relates to fundamental research into the synchronicity of outbreaks. And examples here are renewed research into fundamentals of regional to continental and global dispersal of microbes, including pathogens, not just via hosts, but also through the atmosphere or aquatic environments, and an interrogation of the physical processes that contribute to that dispersal. If we are considering dispersal of pathogens in the context of animal vectors, and I'm thinking of vector-borne diseases here, there's increased research interest to harness autonomous sensing platforms and novel sensor modalities for large scale animal population monitoring and detecting movements also through trade and changes in disease states of hosts. Microbial diversity, climate change and pathogen emergence is another very big topic that we are seeing a lot of development in. And in order to better understand these processes related to pathogen emergence, we are seeing an uptick in basic research to, into the eco, uh, ecological and evolutionary dynamics of microbes in general. The impact of environmental conditions on pathogenesis remains largely unknown and shifts in these abiotic factors will undoubtedly affect microbial um, metabolism and nutrient cycling as well as microbial community assembly, which in turn, of course, can impact colonization and virulence, and for instance, uh, influence the frequency of certain diseases, including zoonotic diseases. So in essence, research into the metabolic activities and enzyme functions at the microbial community level and how this scales up and affects not just individual hosts, but possibly populations or ecosystems on a larger geographic scale could be very important in the future. Uh, from the pandemic, there emerged a very clear recognition of the role that humans and human environments play in disease and pandemic dynamics. And there is an increased focus on the science of complex human behavior at different scales. And research that meaningfully incorporates social and behavioral processes in epidemiological models is particularly critical and at NSF, we have just started a program called Incorporating Human Behavior in Epidemiological Models, which uh, is a collaboration between bio, um, social behavioral and economic sciences and mathematical and physical sciences. For any research that crosses scales, there is a need to enhance and sustain data innovation and to ensure that modeling and forecasting are up to par with the questions. Now, we always have in mind an ideal state of data availability, but the pandemic very clearly showed that scarcity of data is actually the norm. And additionally, outside the lab environment, data streams are often very noisy, they're biased and inconsistent, leading to difficulty in subsequent processing and analysis, including for um, artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques. Um, so determining the most effective method to using limited and noisy data and overcoming gaps while quantifying uncertainty or bias, because those samples often are self-selected convenience samples, um, is one of the primary challenges on the topic of predictive modeling across scales. With respect to machine learning and artificial intelligence methods, there remains the persistent need for improved knowledge representation, learning architecture design, and efficient training frameworks. Now, 
new insights into the interconnected and interdependent systems at the necessary levels of complexity is only going to be achieved by careful integration and coordination across multiple scientific and engineering domains. And one way to successfully and sustainably do that is by developing and training a prepared workforce. This needs to be a diverse workforce that is able to capture diverse perspectives and translate research outcomes into effective interventions in the case of pandemics. Emphasis on team science, also from NSF, is um, critical and best practices are highly welcomed. Um, lastly, perhaps um, pandemic research showed that more so than ever, uh, science cooperation and technological development activities at scale don't happen in a vacuum and issues of equity, fair access, benefit sharing, transparency, ownership, intellectual property, and reproducibility are becoming increasingly important. And those issues scale with working across international borders. And that's that's all I had. Thanks. Thanks, Katarina. And uh, we are doing well on time. So um, we've got a, a couple of minutes where we could, let's try to take uh, one question. And of course I will jump in if I don't see other hands up. I'm being polite though. Okay. Um, so Katarina, I know that um, the in some of the programs that you've mentioned, that these are are highly interdisciplinary, and I think in in the in the pandemic at NSF we we saw um, all of the disciplines basically focus their energy on this single problem, which um, was extraordinary. And I wonder if you could speak to um, what some of the the challenges were in or, or and still are in terms of. Um, uh, integrating those uh, incentives and perspectives across the different disciplines um, and uh, what some of what some of those opportunities are for overcoming them. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think um, it's really important to um, or the pandemic showed how important it is that we all need to kind of reach across the aisle and cooperate across um, different fields and learn each other's language. Uh, and often uh, like this integrative science, I know we've talked about this a very, very long time. Everybody always says, oh, we need to reintegrate biology and so on. But we really need to reintegrate science on a much larger scale. Um, for instance, the part of what I just talked about came out of the effort of the predictive intelligence uh, of pandemic prevention or pandemic prevention program, which is a collaboration internally between the uh, biological sciences, engineering, computer science and engineering, social and behavioral and economic sciences and math and physical sciences. And all of these communities basically had to come, to come together um, and think about what are some of the concepts that we all use and perhaps have different words for it? And what are the things that we um, think are the same, but actually are different? And I know this sounds trivial, but at the very heart often is this very, very fundamental, well, let's just listen to each other and understand what we all mean and then go from there. Um, another point that I wanna make is, we we all, I mean, we do live in an age of, of large data and big data and everybody is enamored with that. But it is really important to understand, well, what kind of data do we actually need to answer these questions? And um, how do we get this data? Um, for the biological sciences, there's a lot of opportunity to reach into the engineering community, especially within the context of the pandemic. It was mind blowing to me, uh, all the different ways that engineers had already thought about how you could sometimes remotely connect, you know, some, some data in remote areas, for instance, where it's very difficult to access. Um, and all of this, although I have 
talked about biosurveillance in the context of um, uh, uh, pandemics, there's all kinds of you know, data that you can get and all kinds of things that could be monitored, including plants or uh, the microbiome at large and so on. So really that kind of interdisciplinarity at a, at a core level is super important to addressing some of these big and outstanding questions that we all have heard in the last two days. And we also would probably recognize that in principle, we have talked about these problems for a long time already. So what is it really that needs to come together here to push push us to the next level. And I, I think the integration of different disciplines, we still have a long way to go. Great, thanks yes. Katarina. All right, so I will go to our next panelist and it's uh, Woody Turner, who is joining us from NASA where uh, Woody is involved with uh, biological diversity and ecological conservation. Uh, working there at headquarters in the Earth Science Division. So I'll hand it over to you, Woody. Hey, can you hear me okay, Stephanie? Yes. And my camera seems to be, there we go. Oh, I got a camera. Okay. Um, thanks very much. Thanks to uh, Jack and the Academy for putting on this, these two days of fantastic discussions. Um, Great to be here with everybody. Great to be on this panel with these great program managers. And um, also just love that uh, keynote talk. Thank you so much for that. I, as somebody who's been working on biodiversity on the research side of the house and conservation on the more applied side of the house here at NASA for a while, um, I, I had to deal with scale issues for a long, long time. And, and when I was getting started in these two programs, I came across pretty early on that classic uh, 1992 paper by our keynote speaker, and it just sort of <laughs> helped me make the case with a group of other program scientists around NASA who are mostly, you know, physics, physics folks or chemists that, you know, this really could work and that it's all physics after all, right? So it gave me a lot of cover. So really, I, I, I thank you so much for that talk. It's very integrative. Loved it. Um, want to talk about a couple of things. One, I want to start uh, with some history, then go quickly into uh, a good thing, then talk about two challenges, and then end on a sort of an up note, a good thing note again, uh, if I could. So next slide, please. Thanks for the slide. Um, so NASA has been looking at the Earth from space for a while, and in doing that, we've had some, I would say, biologically relevant global and thus continental scale products for some time, thinking here about various vegetation indices or um, land cover maps, light leaf area indices, evapotranspiration, et cetera, on land and the ocean, uh, chlorophyll A products, organic carbon products, et cetera, um, as, as exemplified on this global view from 2017. I'll note, however, that all of these, basically up to the, up to the current day, the vast majority of our biologically relevant products, I'll call them, have been looking at greenness at various levels, stages of greenness, both on land and in the water. And as we've been here, we heard yesterday, and I'm just going to repeat some of it today, we're entering into a golden age of sensing, uh, both from the satellite perspective as well as the in situ perspective. And so, um, very excited about the level of observations that are coming together across scales. The challenge, though, is, is avoiding the sort of the Tower of Babel problem and making sense out of all these observations. So next slide, please. So briefly, um, I'm not going to, Dave Schimmel and others touched on this yesterday. Uh, we're going from sort of multispectral focus on greenness to uh, hyperspectral imaging spectrometers that get us the full spectrum in the visible shortwave infrared give us added dimensionality, really letting us get down to finer levels of taxonomy, in some cases, certainly phylogeny that we've been able to do before. Uh, we've got active systems with lasers and radars in the microwave, bringing back different types of data sets on structure and helping us find water, et cetera. Uh, thermal data of higher resolutions, getting us the key temperature variables that are so important for life. And of course, we were also getting, you know, Industry is bringing out high spatial resolution data that we're accessing through agreements with them and making available to our funded investigators. 
And of course, we've got a um, host of other systems as well. On the in situ side, uh, there's a comparable, I would say, explosion in organismal level data and as well as omics data below that. But at the organismal level, you've got camera traps, acoustic systems, networks of these things coming together. You've got increasingly powerful tagging technologies. They're not only telling us where something is and when, but what it's doing there. Uh, it's, it's, it's physiology or it's behavior without the solometry and things like that. So uh, as well as we've got, you know, tons of, of, of abundance and distribution data coming through from citizen science platforms, et cetera. So in a sense, we are now really awash in observations, uh, but as at different scales. And as we're all out here sort of looking, I think all of us are out here sort of looking for patterns. Um, as we and as we know from that classic paper that I referred to earlier, uh, the driver or the mechanisms behind the patterns that we're seeing, either with satellite data or in situ data for that matter, often are happening at scales different from the patterns we're recognizing. And so that brings together back to what Katarina was saying: the, the foremost challenge for us in working at continental scales or any scales is bringing data together across scales and integrating uh, those data. Um, we need this Rosetta Stone, otherwise we truly are living in a time when it's just a bunch of different observations in different networks, largely speaking different languages that one another observer can't understand, and we can't make sense of the, the and can't do the cross scale work that we need to do. Um, next slide, please. So there, I think, a, so that's good news, but a, a real challenge. I think the challenge may get addressed in two areas. One is is is, is one more technical, the other more. Uh, basic science. The technical one is just data systems and how we, we manage information, uh, which we've been helped out in terms of phenomena like Moore's Law for the past decades. We can handle big data now in ways we couldn't handle it before. But our approaches, I would say, haven't really kept up with our compute power. Um, from a NASA perspective, we're, we build missions. We build things, launch into space, and, and, and our data systems and our science teams that use those data are largely very mission-centric. Um, so we are coming sort of late to this, but in the last few years, we suddenly had the aha that, oh my gosh, we've got all these missions up there now. We've got to start doing um, integrated data systems so that data from one mission, a radar, say, can talk to data from another mission, LIDAR, or some sort of optical sensor, uh, passive optical sensor to make sense of it all. And so we're, we're doing this this activity called the Earth Information System, or EIS, which has tools like VEDA. I have to actually look these acronyms up. They make it crazy. The Visualization Exploration Data Analysis Project, or the MAP, the Multi-Mission Algorithm Analysis Project, both in terms of trying to visualize data, allow us to analyze it, play with it, but also to develop common algorithms all in the cloud uh, with common metadata that allow us to, to work data across our very missions. Now, we have to go beyond obviously multi-mission in this case. We've got to we've got to bring in in situ data sets as data sets as well and bring them into this construct. We're also doing that. I say we tend to be more national centric than perhaps we should be, but we are doing in situ now and space data better. It's still we're still uh, a, a number of years behind where we where we need to be. Um, and of course, as we're doing this, we're also trying to do it in the context of open source science. Uh, which I think complements it a great deal, but it also complicates just how, you know, in terms of what we develop, what we build, what we use has to be more open than ever before. Again, I think that's good for the long-term goal. Um, quickly moving on to models, um, I'll say that, well, a couple of things. Uh, one, um, global large-scale and continental-scale ecosystem or what I call biodiversity models are rare. Uh, we heard about DGVMs and the, the keynote talk, and those are those are great. Um, we've got Mattingly out of Cambridge, which is doing some other interesting work. Most of these big scale models are built around guilds or traits, uh, fairly coarse. The new data we have, both top down from, from satellites and airborne systems and bottom up from in situ organismal and other systems, is allowing us to sort of fill in the gaps and do more agent-based type work, as we heard about the keynote. Uh, but it's still a volume issue uh, and a challenge to how to build the right model at scale to get us to what the way most biologists think about the world, which is in terms of species and genera and at the taxonomic levels or perhaps phylogenetic 
tools, but not so much in terms of traits, which can be flexible and changing depending on who's doing the, the, the finding. Um, so we, we, we need to work back toward that. We have the data to do it, but it means building more sophisticated models that are simple, yet somehow have the information that makes sense to a biologist. Um, the other challenge here uh, is that at least at NASA, and this is probably true at other places, our, our data management infrastructure and our modeling, particularly our large-scale modeling infrastructure with, with the GCM folks and the guys who do the big top-down stuff with Sally did, are largely in separate silos, separate areas. Um, and so we've got to integrate literally and physically <laughs> in terms of a place, maybe it's a virtual place, but a place as well as bureaucratically and, and in terms of our science teams who we fund to do work, we've got to integrate the data management side of the house and the um, modeling research side of the houses. Um, that's not to say that, you know, science teams don't work with data systems, but they're, they've been so mission focused in the past that it was very much a, you know, tunnel vision discipline, you know, mission only approach that didn't allow us to incorporate data from other missions or in situ data sets of, of various, various types. Um, finally, I'll end on, some, on, on a positive note, um, in which case I think maybe our technology and our, our science may be actually lagging for a change, the policy world, which is hard to imagine in this case, in that over the last few years, we've seen the development of a global, of global mechanisms uh, to focus on biodiversity and its loss somewhat analogous to what the climate community did, I'd say about 20 years before the biodiversity folks got around to it. And by this, I'm talking about global mechanisms for observations, for assessment, and for policy on the observation front. We have the group on our Earth on Earth observations, or GEO, they have a biodiversity observation network, GEOFON, which is coordinating global observations of, bio, of biodiversity and relevant parameters. At the assessment level, we've got the IPBES, the Intergovernmental Policy, science policy platform on biodiversity and some services, which mirrors think of IPCC, but for, for biodiversity. And of course, at the, at the policy level, there are various conventions, particularly the CBD, Commission on Biological Diversity, which just has COP, big COP15 last December. Um, that's, again, like UN Framework for Climate Change, sort of bringing that together and coming up with policies. Um, I'll note that these are mirrored, at least on the policy side and on the assessment side, with efforts in the U.S., where we've got a, a it's America Beautiful Executive Order coordinating policy at the domestic level, we also have a national nature assessment. Think of um, the IPPS assessment at a national level. So things are happening. Um, we have a, 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 an increasingly robust, I think, framework in which to put our improved models and data that incorporate um, cross-scalar dimensions. So I'm going to end it there, and hopefully. I left some time for the questions of the next speaker. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Woody. You went you went all the way up to the end of the 10-minute slot. So um, we'll go ahead and move on to the next um, panelist. And um, But then I think the agenda has time for um, questions at, uh, at the end. Yes, uh, we do. OK. Great. So our next panelist is Todd Anderson from uh, Department of Energy. And uh, Todd is the director of the Biological System Science Division within the Office of Biological and Environmental Research. And so uh, this division has a wide diversity of, of programs, of course, and I will not show up any more of Todd's time um, and, uh, and let him take it over. Yeah, I'm hoping to, hoping to share my screen here. Oh, come on. Shoot. Kat, I figured this would happen. I don't know if uh, you have my PDF. Yep. There we go. All right. Well, um, thank you for the introduction, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, I recognize some few faces on the committee, and and uh, so I, what I have is, uh, I think some folks will be familiar with uh, kind of a description of our, um, our, our efforts and um, the uh, components that we have um, within the division. But I think um, I'll end on a couple examples that I think we can talk about. 
So I'm Todd Anderson. I'm, I'm from the uh, DOE's Office of Science. Uh, next slide, please. Um, if you don't know, we are a basic research entity. We have eight different uh, program offices now within the Office of Science, and I'm representing the Biological and Environmental uh, Research Office, uh, of which we have uh, two uh, divisions that comprise the office. And I'm representing today the Biological System Sciences Division, uh, which is home to GOE's major, uh, DOE's major efforts in genomics research, tied more towards its energy mission, um, and Sally McFarland uh, is uh, currently an acting director for our Earth and Environmental System Sciences Division, which is home to DOE's major climate modeling efforts uh, across several scales and environmental programs. And I'll touch on those programs uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, but let me focus on the Biological System Sciences Division. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, we are a uh, uh, primarily a genomics focused program. Um, focused on plants and microbes. We have a history going all the way back to initiating the Human Genome Project, but we've branched out since then and are looking at uh, a wide range of plants and microbial species from a genomic perspective, uh, looking at ways to uh, provide the necessary fundamental science to understand, predict, manipulate, and design biological processes that underpin innovations for bioenergy and bioproduct production from plant biomass, and, and also to enhance the understanding of natural environmental processes re of relevance to DOE. We have four major objectives in the portfolio. Uh, first is just understanding the information encoded in the genome sequence of plants and microorganisms and how does that explain the functional characteristics of cells, organisms, and whole systems. Uh, we're also looking at interactions among cells that regulate the function and behavior, or behavior of living systems and how can we understand those uh, behaviors dynamically and importantly, predictably. Um, we're also very interested in how um, organisms from uh, different kingdoms interact. For example, how plants, microbes, and communities of organisms adapt and respond to changing environmental conditions, and how can that behavior be manipulated for desired outcomes that feeds directly into our, our efforts in bioenergy. And lastly, um, because of all the, all the, uh, the um, primarily because of the enormous amount of genomic and omic and uh, all kinds of biological data that we're generating in the program, we're also moving towards um, what uh, and understanding what organizing biological principles need to be understood to facilitate the design and engineering of new biological systems. Uh, so we're heavily engaged in metabolic engineering and or, or what could be called synthetic biology. Next slide, please. So to give you a visual uh, of what the, uh, the division looks like, we have major uh, research efforts in bioenergy research biosystems design research and environmental research. Our main effort right now is in bioenergy. Uh, we have a range of different projects from, from the very large, the bioenergy research center, centers down to single PI projects, looking at uh, uh, the BRCs are focused at a more comprehensive level, looking at how we convert plant biomass to a range of fuels and chemicals that we normally get from petroleum to individual complementary efforts in uh, looking at microbial systems that could be adapted uh, in that bioenergy mission, looking at plant genomics to develop dedicated plant uh, crops, uh, uh, bioenergy crops, and sustainable bioenergy research that combines expertise in microbial systems with plant systems in the field to understand how we cultivate dedicated bioenergy crops. Our biosystems design portfolio is, is, is uh, a nice way of saying, again, uh, synthetic biology or metabolic engineering. We're actually using the information that we're generating in our programs to design new functions into organisms, uh, microbes, and plants. And our environmental research is home to our microbiome science, which has uh, evolved over the years. We're still very interested in the activities of microbial communities in a wide ranging environments and their ability to control the flux of carbon and nutrients uh, in the environment. Um, it's also a major discovery element for the rest of the portfolio. You can imagine uh, pulling out uh, different microbes from different environments and plugging those into the other major research elements in the portfolio. Those big um, Three main research efforts are supported by a range of uh, enabling capabilities uh, in computational biology, which is also a research component in and of itself, but we also host, host several uh, online open access platforms uh, to help make sense of the, uh, the, the, uh, all the OMIC information that we're developing in the program. We also have a, a small uh, bio, a bio character, characterization and imaging science portfolio that's developing new imaging technologies. Uh, both classical and quantum science informed imaging technologies like entanglement for biological samples were part, if you can believe it, part of the larger quantum information science uh, effort, uh, but we have a very focused um, uh, uh, part of that portfolio on adapting quantum science efforts to uh, bioimaging. And then, uh, of course, DOE is home and we're home 
uh, to uh, um, a couple of uh, uh, DOE user facilities. We are the administrative home to the Joint Genome Institute. Our larger office is home to the Environmental Molecular Sciences Laboratory, and we have access to the uh, structural biology resources at the synchrotron light and neutron sources and other DOE uh, user facilities. Um, the research is complemented by our efforts in SBIR, Early Career Awards, the Office of Science Graduate Student Research, and, and EPSCoR Awards. Uh, next slide, please. Just another visual um, uh, with three main elements uh, to the portfolio. The genomic science program is two thirds of our budget. That's where the bulk of our research is. And um, you're, you're seeing a, 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 an overlaid image because there was a two part in my PowerPoint that didn't come up. But our, our, um, you see a lot of effort in, uh, if you look down through the genomic sciences program, you see our efforts in bioenergy. How do we convert plant biomass to fuels and products? microorganisms, uh, uh, looking at a range of different microorganisms for bioenergy applications, plant genomics, understanding plant gene function uh, in the, with the goal of developing uh, dedicated bioenergy crops, sustainability research, looking at how to grow those crops in the field, our biosystems design work, synthetic biology and my, uh, metabolic engineering for a wide range of manufacturing purposes, and our environmental microbiome science, looking at uh, principles of microbial ecology, and our computational biosciences, looking at computational capabilities and developing out a variety of different platforms. Our um, imaging capabilities, I, I mentioned earlier, and of course, our facilities and infrastructure with the Joint Genome uh, Institute being a central source of uh, genomic and omic information, but also in, um, analysis capabilities for interpreting that information. And all of that portfolio is guided towards uh, multiple um, aspects of the DOE mission, including bioeconomy research, biotechnology development, synthetic biology, biosecurity, and quantum information science. Next slide. I uh, wanted to just mention uh, the, uh, the resources that are available both within the division and the larger uh, DOE Office of Science. I mentioned our, our user facilities, the Joint Genome Institute, the Environmental Molecular Sciences Laboratory, uh, but also uh, through the BER Structural Biology Resources, there's Beamline Time, or Beamline and, and other kinds of imaging and analytical capabilities at the, uh, the DOE Synchrotron and Light, Neus light, uh, uh, and, um, synchrotron light Neutron Sources for a variety of, of uh, capabilities. But um, I think you've already heard about some of the computational platforms that I think would feed into a, a larger view of, of biology, a continental view of biology. Our DOE Systems Biology Knowledge Base is a, uh, an analysis platform, again, open access. Um, it, uh, it's tailor-made for, for researchers bringing genome sequence to the platform and turning those genome, that genome sequence into metabolic models in which to develop hypotheses for further bench testing or using um, those metabolic mo models uh, in a variety of different environmental models for predicting the activity of microbial com communities in the environment. Um, I think you already heard a presentation from Emily um, Elofradoros about the National Microbiome Data Collaborative, a source for microbiome data uh, uh, and all the metadata that goes with uh, a microbiome data set. Uh, we're also home with, uh, we don't also have the advantage of having um, significant computational resources available at the um, uh, 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 National Energy Research uh, Supercomputing Center at Berkeley. And our colleagues in the Earth and Environmental System Sciences also run a, a environmental data uh, database, the um, um, uh, Environmental System Sciences uh, Data Integrative uh, Virtual Environment, or ESS Dive. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to just um, tell you uh, just a, a brief overview of the division and its activities, uh, but I wanted to end with these two examples that I think are relevant to a continental scale biology. One of these is a project led out of um, Pacific Northwest National Lab. This is out of our Earth and Environmental System Sciences portfolio. It's called the Wonders Project. It's a worldwide hydro uh, biogeochemistry observation network for dynamic river systems. This is a, um, a burgeoning global effort to provide uh, samples of uh, primarily aquatic systems and, and sampled and analyzed in a, in a standard way and providing a, a, a growing database, including genomic database, of a snapshot of microbial communities at different environmental points across the planet. It's an interesting concept that I think could be a, a step stool to build on if we're looking at larger um, uh, constructs or larger um, um, aspects of biological or continental biology. And the second one here is something out of our, uh, um, out of our bioenergy portfolio, and it's looking at um, uh, common gardens that, that host um, a range of native species of switchgrass across quite a latitude across the breadth of the country. And um, so these uh, native grasses have been sequenced um, and to the level that you can, uh, we can now correlate changes in the genomic structure of switchgrass species in these common gardens with um, uh, 
perhaps uh, geolog uh, geographic changes, climate change, climate adaptations, or various biogeochemical uh, conditions at, uh, at those sites. And that opens up a whole lot, I think, of larger scale genomic and uh, experimental um, work that we could do that could combine with, um, you know, uh, uh, larger, more mac macroscopic understanding of, of these systems. And again, I, I, I'm picking up on what Simon was talking about, about taking patterns and microscopic elements and moving them to the macroscopic. And I, in this format with, at least in plant biology, and we have a couple examples um, of plants that have been uh, sequenced in this way uh, where we could build on that. So I, I would just like to leave you with, with those two examples for, for discussion. And I'll stop there. Great, Todd, thank you. Um, so we are, are just up against the, the time slot. And so I'll go ahead and move on to our next um, panelist and we can save any questions for um, our session just after that. So our next panelist is Scott Haggerty, uh, who is the Interim National Director of EPA Sustainable and Healthy Communities Research Program in the Office of Research and Development. And again, uh, the speaker's full bios are in your briefing book. So I'll, um, I'll let you uh, explore that and uh, we'll go ahead and just turn it over to Scott now. Thank you, Stephanie. <clears throat> um, it is indeed a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about how EPA incorporates scale into its applied research to support the agency in protecting human health and the environment. Uh, one of our primary mandates of ORD is to provide the science to support statutory mandates. <clears throat> one of the things I believe in thinking about this presentation is what is our connection to continental scale biology? And I believe it really lies with our work in using an integrated systems approach to protecting human health and the environment. <clears throat> SHC, the Sustainable Healthy Communities, is one of six national research programs that identifies the applied research required to fulfill the agency's mission. and and its strategic goals and objectives. Um, many of you are you know, probably well familiar with the other national programs, including air, climate, and energy, chemical safety for sustainability, health and environmental risk assessment, homeland security, safe and sustainable water resources. <clears throat> um, you may also be familiar that we've just completed the strategic research action plans, which is our four-year plan of research that will be conducted to achieve the agency's mission. One of the unique things about this strategic research action plan was that the national program directors worked together to combine efforts on six cross-cutting priorities um, that are looking to conduct research that advances science that informs public and ecosystem health decisions and community efforts. And these six priorities are environmental justice, cumulative impacts, climate change, community resilience, children's health, contaminants of immediate and emerging concern. From one of the founding um, paradigms for EPA in its use in regulatory decisions is the source to exposure to effects paradigm. Um, these are typically media specific single um, single pollutant efforts, you know, and this effort really remains the stalwart of the agency. It is what the majority of our regulatory decisions are based upon. Many of you are probably familiar with the integrated risk information systems, the IRIS assessments. Those are the gold standard assessments, which sets the hazard identification used in a risk analysis. <clears throat> but I, um, I really wanna draw your attention to kind of the way that we've been thinking now over the last five to 10 years. Um, and that is really trying to understand the complex positive and negative interrelationships between humans and the environment. And that this simple frame really has now become the foundation of how we think about EPA's research and how we plan EPA's research. <clears throat> Through a systematic approach, we approach problems holistically, integrating human health and ecological sciences across scales from molecular to ecosystems to achieve the sustainable solutions and provide the rigorous scientific evidence to support decisions. In this framework, we include the examination of multiple stressors and the integration of data, knowledge, and perspectives of multiple stakeholders and scientific disciplines, including the natural, social, behavioral, economics, and decision sciences. <clears throat> I think what's unique about EPA is that when you think about scales, you know, our heart of, of our research is humans uh, is at the organism level. And for the remainder of the talk, I'll really focus on humans and that perspective 
um, from the organism perspective and think about scale from that. Um, if you consider it over those course of the years, we've made considerable investments and that have made, we've been making considerable investments in understanding the dose concentration effects on health outcomes. And it was really nice to hear the earlier talks um, presenting, especially from Annika, where she actually talked about <clears throat> the dose response and the health outcomes, because that is a, a critical component of what we do from the human health perspective down to the lower scales, looking at um, everything from the organ to the molecular to the cellular levels. <clears throat> um, one of the useful tools in thinking about this has been the development and the advancement of adverse outcome pathways. Um, these model systems are really useful to identify the sequence of molecular and cellular events that produce a toxic effect when an organism is exposed to a substance. <clears throat> EPA has been rapidly developing advances in computational toxicology, bioinformatics, chemometrics, high throughput screening, combined with data from clinical trials, epidemiological studies, and health records to expand the databases of chemical toxicity and patterns of health information. These advances, significant, um, have, provided, have allowed for the development of indicators and metrics that have improved our monitoring as, as have the assessment protocols and application to provide a range of products to inform a variety of decisions. <clears throat> While decreasing scales are needed to understand how chemicals and pollutants cause health outcomes, increasing scales are required to understand exposure and sources from organisms to populations to communities to ecosystems. At the population level, we see intrinsic biological factors as the important determinants in pollutant or multiple pollutant adverse health outcomes. Um, this can include pre-existing disease, life stages, reproductive status, age, sex, and genetics. Over the last several decades, we have taken a, a, a greater approach in expanding our knowledge as to what impacts health outcomes. We have increasingly included the coupled influence of ex extrinsic social and structural factors on health outcome. By this, we are acknowledging the differential susceptibility to exposure results in different health risks to communities, expanding our studies to include poverty, racism, discrimination, social and income equality, access to healthcare, and geography and occupational risk. Recently within ORD, we produced a report on cumulative impacts and how we can use that to influence the science or how we can use that to inform the science that we're conducting. In that report, we provided a definition for cumulative impacts and defined them as the totality of exposures to combinations of chemicals and non-chemical stressors and their effects on health, well-being, and the quality of life outcomes. These cumulative impacts include contemporary exposures to multiple stressors, as well as exposures throughout a person's lifetime. They are influenced by the distribution of stressors and encompasses both direct and indirect effect to people through impacts on resources in the environment. Cumulative impacts can be considered in the context of individuals, geographically defined communities, and defining definable population groups. Critical to this is the development of cumulative impact assessments which here we define as the process evaluating both quantitative and qualitative data representing cumulative impacts to inform a decision. Cumulative impact assessments requires a systematic approach to characterize the combined effects from exposure to both chemical and non-chemical stressors over time across the affected population, group, or community. It elevates how stressors from the built, natural, and social environments affect groups of people in both positive and negative ways. The elements of a cumulative impact assessment include community role and community involvement throughout the assessment, such as identifying problems, potential interventions, decision points to improve community health and well being. <clears throat> um, our efforts are really kind of at this, late, at this stage are really beginning to kind of take into account the chemical and non chemical stressors. It's thinking holistically about the problems that we have to address. From a research perspective, it is through this lens of cumulative impacts, which is what how we are beginning to integrate the impacts of global megatrends such as climate change, economic power shifts, demographic changes, rapid urbanization, and technology to connect that into our um, research planning and thinking of terms of exposures and how those change over time, especially when it comes to susceptible populations. 
Our research por portfolio is robust. Over the next four years, we'll produce somewhere in the neighborhood of 770 different research products, um, of which almost 122 are, will be tied directly to environmental justice and cumulative impact um, research efforts. Um, <clears throat> starting to lose my voice, I'm sorry. Uh, and we also look at this from a very expanded um, plat or a very expansive portfolio of work. It includes tools, methods, databases, approaches, um, chemical assessments that that there's way too many for me to sit here and talk about. Um, we can talk about the the databases such as EnviroAtlas, um, our climate scenarios, ecosystem goods and services, our work on social sciences and community engagement. Um, all this work is being collected to really enhance how we look at our science and how our science informs decision making. Through a cumulative impacts approach, we're looking at, um, for example, I'll provide you with a couple examples. So one is looking through um, the risk and vulnerabilities of our contaminated um, Superfund sites and where they're located and how they'll be responsive or how they may be impacted from um, increased climate change. Hold on one second, I just lost that, there we go. Um, and how we can couple those into our work on exposure sciences, on toxo toxicology, and to, to be able to understand the risk that those communities that will be experiencing in response to climate change. Um, I think one of the clearest examples of how we incorporate scale in, across the system is our examples of harmful algal blooms. The portfolio of work associated with harmful algal blooms focuses on not only the toxicology of the different toxins and developing methods to, ass to assess them rapidly and quickly, but then also looking at the treatment technologies that can be used to you know, clean a water supply um, once, a, once an event is going on. But some of the most um, relevant work as it comes to continental biology is the use of satellite data to monitor in near real time the presence of cyanobacteria blooms in 2,000 large lakes across the country. This information is available to, to people at, um, on their phones. They can look at it. People can, and it's available to the public. They can look to see whether or not these 2,000 large, one of these 2,000 large lakes is about to experience a harmful out or a um, cyanobacteria bloom. And then managers on the ground can direct their resources to those sites to determine whether or not they need to be doing a health advisory because the bloom is indeed toxic and is approaching a beach. Um, one of the other benefits of this is it's providing us the actual first um, real term um, national coverage of whether or not harmful algal blooms are increasing or de decreasing. Um, we're able to use this information and report it on the report on EPA's report on the environment to show the status and trends of harmful algal blooms in the United States. And I'm excited to actually say that more recently, um, within the last month, our research teams on the Cyan app have been able to, to develop an algorithm that allows them to predict with 80% confidence whether or not a harmful algal bloom will occur one week in advance of these 2000 lakes. Small little step, but it's the first time that we have a national coverage of, uh, uh, we actually have a way to predict and forecast whether or not a harmful algal bloom will occur. <clears throat> More excitingly is that with the launch of a geospatial satellite coming up, we'll be able to take that application and provide it out to the more than 300,000 freshwater lakes across the country and to provide that same type of capability. So that is one way in which we go from the human health impact of being exposed to potential harmful algal bloom all the way up to how we can um, manage and provide a global scale um, analysis around that. I think I'm bumping up on time, so I'll stop there, although we do have another really exciting one uh, with the launch of the Trophosphere Emissions Monitoring and Pollution Satellite that just went up last week. Great, Scott. You are right on time. Thank you so much. So all the panelists have been uh, superb in managing their time. And um, Scott, we actually, uh, our last panelist had to cancel. So we have a few extra minutes if you want to go ahead and talk about that uh, launch. I'd, I'd welcome that. Yeah, so um, our assistant administrator, Chris Frey, was actually able to attend uh, NASA's launch of the Trophosphere Emissions Monitoring and Pollution Satellite um, that 
went up into space, not last week, but the week before. And this is a geostationary satellite. And if, to all the NASA folks online, if I if I mess this up, that's because I'm I'm an aquatic ecologist. Um, <clears throat> the the satellite will once it's once it's up, will be able to conduct hourly scans at high resolution, measuring pollutants that include ozone, nitrogen dioxide, and formaldehyde, with pixels of a few kilometers on a side. Um, this information will allow um, researchers and others to look at on a global or on the national scale, what is the pattern um, of these, these air pollutants across the country? <clears throat> but it will also allow you to kind of go in on the community level to focus in on what is the potential exposure that one may anticipate or can you, you know, forecast when a community is gonna be um, exposed to one of these potential chemicals. And then you can actually go ahead and, and advise on health advisory. When you couple this work with the, our efforts to kind of work with communities on the ground to um, <clears throat> uh, take the knowledge that we have in terms of our exposure and what the toxic, toxicological values are. It is a really powerful tool that, again, kind of connects you from the source to um, exposure to actually being able to make a, a difference and protect people before they become exposed to it. And I will just add like one one. In this effort to kind of expand our um, ORD's research efforts, we have made a significant investment in social scientists over the last year and a half. We now have somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 social scientists that will be coming on board our organization to help us understand both the intrinsic and extrinsic factors that a community can be faced with. Great. Thanks, and Scott. I will say I'll need to jump off in about five minutes because I need to go convinced 315 um, long-term ecological research graduate students to come work in the government. Worthy work, thank you. All right, um, so let's see, as I mentioned, our uh, last uh, panelist had to, to cancel. And so we can go ahead and jump into some uh, questions. And I, I know that we did have some questions come in already uh, through the Slido. Um, but I can also open it up for our committee members here. Um, Jack. Yes, thank you so much, uh, um, Stephanie, all the great speakers, and uh, really enjoy your uh, talks, and also really appreciate the great support you provided to the scientific community working across different scales and on different topics. And um, yesterday there was a speaker uh, commenting about the not sufficient, long enough support for a lot of research. I know many of your agencies have been supporting long-term research. And um, I'm wondering what kind of uh, experience you have in supporting those long-term research or whether you have new plans to support future long-term uh, research. Thank you so much. This will be for all the speakers. Anybody wanna take that on? Uh, I'll, 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 I'll start. Yeah. So I, I think the, uh, in our portfolio, we do have a range of, um, of uh, different long-term long efforts. Um, we do have, um, at the shorter range, we do have funding opportunities that go out to the academic world across uh, a variety of different disciplines. Those are generally on a three, but sometimes a five-year basis. Uh, we do have longer-term programs at the DOE labs, and these are the science focus area projects that are usually team-oriented. Um, they're also uh, on a three-year, three to five-year basis, primarily on a three-year basis, uh, reviewed on progress, but but they are, uh, they are meant to be um, somewhat longer term. They do come and go, uh, but they are longer term than your standard academic grant. Um, there's also a lot of, uh, there's several um, major experimental programs in the DOE portfolio, primarily in uh, our sister division, um, long-term ecological, ecological experiments, uh, the Spruce Project up in northern Minnesota would be one example um, that's been running for quite a while and uh, is an iteration of the old FACE program um, experiments that many may be familiar with. <clears throat> so there are, um, we do have occasional opportunities for longer-term experiments. And, 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 the, um, and the opportunity for large, uh, more long-term experiments at the DOE labs. Um, I'll just leave that there. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. 
Thanks, Tom. Um, Louise. Uh, thank you very much for all the talks. This also is a question for, for kind of like two parts, actually, for everyone. Um, <clears throat> so in, in Simon's talk, he talked about the sort of the integration of data and what we need to, you know, questions about what to know in terms of understanding how uh, global ecosystems work. Um, and, and so I was interested in the committee's uh, or the panelists' thoughts on um, the integration. So it was really exciting hearing about everyone's perspective and the databases that are being developed for each particular agency. Um, but the, the perspectives were different, and it seems like we need an integration of the, those perspectives even across agencies to actually attack this problem. For example, pollution affecting uh, uh, global aspects. So I'd just like to hear your thoughts about integration of, of, of data across agencies and um, also the computational tools across agencies. Anybody want to tackle that one? I can I can try. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I do think um, a lot of our efforts, but you know, we do a lot of collaborations and, and a lot of work with our federal partners and other agencies. And so we do a lot of work with NEIH and NIH and NOAA and NASA. And so a lot of the original platforms and development, I think there's because we're doing those in collaboration, I think we're we're pretty we're pretty good there in terms of more recently in terms of having the same information or at least an understanding. We have those discussions early on. Um, mm -hmm. We have a lot of discussions about, you know, where does the data sit? Well, if it's especially with satellite data, for example, where does it sit? Who has it? I think our biggest challenges is when we actually are looking at other data sets that essentially aren't within aren't within our, our family. Um, and a lot of those is access to health records. Um, as we begin to go down there, that path, of looking and getting information, you know, not not every county or even every state collects health data at a hospital the same way. And so being able to kind of gather that information when, when we can access it publicly is according to all and meeting all the guidelines. I mean, that's a that's a significant challenge. And so it, yeah. it's really, I think, looking at looking at the broader spectrum of data integration. Thanks, Great. Uh, thank you. Um, Woody, did, were you raising your hand to um, sure. answer that? Yeah, I was just going to respond to Louise's question. I think, you know, the U.S. Global Change Research Program has been up for a couple of decades now. It does a lot of climate uh, research work across agencies. For example, the carbon area, there's a, a fairly robust cross-agency collaboration. I think we could do a better job, again, at, at, you know, <laughs> integrating our systems for managing and holding data uh, and also on some modeling. Oh, there is There's some good at least in the carbon world, there's some cross-modeling efforts that's going on across a number of the agencies, some of who are on this call. So it's happening. It's not, I would say, it's not, it's, it's biology is a bit behind carbon um, in this regard. And uh, if we want to make progress, we need to step it up. Thanks, Wendy. Um, Annika, were you also going to speak to this? Yeah, I was I was also going to say this conversation is happening at NIH and even in our field of environmental health sciences. I have colleagues who are spearheading kind of an environmental health language collaborative. So, you know, pulling together academic researchers and NIH folk and other stakeholders um, into developing a harmonized language and data and metadata standards as we continue to increase the number of data streams that we're trying to work with. Um, and I also wanted to highlight the challenge of training as we're expecting the new generation of researchers to be increasingly interdisciplinary. That's just a consideration that we have to have. Um, different disciplines are gonna have different ways of doing things, but as they reach out and incorporate other disciplines into their work, it just, um, we need to have that integration strategy in place. That's great, thank you. And Katerina, did you? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, second uh, what Annika just said about the training. Um, that's also something that uh, we have been thinking a lot about at NSF. And perhaps one other uh, piece to add on the data front is it's not just about data that's available across federal agencies, but also in the industry, like, uh, you know, when uh, some of the data that we needed to 
kind of uh, get access to in the uh, context of pandemic research, um, a lot of these data sets are pretty biased because they're kind of self-selected convenience uh, data and not necessarily purposefully or purposive sampling. Um, and so there is kind of a level where uh, there needs to be a little bit of a reset in terms of um, really kind of high precision, uh, perhaps spatial technologies that collect data independent of particular uh, individual kind of uh, research uh, um, streams. Um, yeah, that's all. Thanks. And Scott? Yeah, just to, and I think maybe to close this out, I, I know it was discussed yesterday, but within EPA, one of our biggest struggles is figuring out how to incorporate citizen science or what we now call participatory science into um, our decision making. Um, on a regulatory side, it, it, it's a pretty high bar for the information that has to go in to make a regulatory determination or a decision. Um, but it doesn't mean that participatory science and our work with communities isn't value and needed. And so it's a it's. It is an ongoing effort to figure out how to use this type of information and how to use personal sensor information and phone data. And so I think as these new data streams come online and they're coming from a series of different sources, um, the struggle is essentially when and where we can use them in different in different decision contexts. Yeah. Thank you. Shahid. Yeah, thanks. Um, I wanted to to perhaps dress as the whole thing. It's really fascinating for me to hear from the different uh, uh, speakers here on the panel. Um, and what got me sort of curious is that, you know, we were, once I was at the University of Minnesota a while back, where Janine is now, and um, we were funded by DOE to um, do a free air carbon dioxide enrichment experiment. And the unit there was the species. You know, how many species, one, two, four, eight, 16, things like that, I guess it was nine or 16. Um, I was thinking that when it comes to the socio-ecological work, I think Jack um, had published a paper some time ago saying that you know the household is the right unit, not the uh, not the individual, not the not the the county, right? Um, and um, and then you know, it, and so this is motivated by thinking about size uh, presentation, which he was talking about linking the microscopic to the macroscopic, but in some case the microscopic was the bird, not the genome of the bird, <laughs> not you know. Uh, uh, some particular focus of it. If you want to understand the macro pattern of the flocks, which were amazing, um, you really needed to understand the level of the bird. But um, I saw a lot of um, uh, uh, heavy focus. I was surprised actually at how much of DOE's resources are going towards, um, you know, genomics. And I'll, I'll just end with one more example. Right now in ecology, one of the biggest, you know, sort of uh, paradigm shifts has been to work on what we call the trait, because we realize the traits of the organisms can link up to the functions of the ecosystems. But a trait might be specific leaf area, a rate of photosynthesis, a relative growth rate. And this is going to be a massively polygenic trait, with which the genome would not help you at all in terms of trying to link it all the way up. On the other hand, I, I can see when you're trying to look at, say, toxic algal blooms, that understanding the, uh, the genomics of the cyanobacteria and linking that with the lake as the geophysical unit um, actually makes sense. So, to what extent, you know, is there, um, you know, a, a sort of a, a, an interest in putting out RFPs or calls for research that actually begins with the right unit to lead to the to to, to the right outcome? Um, or do you just say, well, we're looking for research that's actually going to work on, you know, uh, this massive uh, genomic data or these really high resolution things? Or are we going to say we're interested in this phenomenon? The right unit is the species, the organism, the trait? Sorry, it's an elaborate question. <laughs> I know, and so, you, yeah, it's hard. Yeah, yeah, um, so, um, bravo, that's, that's the, that, it, that is the mark. <laughs> and, and we run into this, uh, uh, it's not interagency, uh, you know, it's not intergovernmental um, uh, activities. We run into this right within our own office. Uh, we, we have the, uh, the Biological System Science Division, the Earth and Environmental System Sciences. Those are operating at two vastly different scales, and we run into this all the time. How do we bridge those scales? Uh, what kind of activity can we take on jointly that would help resolve the kinds of questions you were just asking? Uh, you know, what, what is the right, uh, the right uh, item to look at? 
um, in explaining environments. And, and I think we, we've struggled with that for years. I don't, I don't think we have an answer yet, um, but uh, uh, I mean, that you, you, hit the, the, uh, you hit it right on the mark. Uh, we've been struggling with that for years. So and need to do something about it. Todd, I've got a, a, a follow-up question. So if, um, I mean, there is, there is this big interest in traits and uh, the proteome is more closely linked to traits. And is there any interest in, um, in DOE or mechanisms in DOA, DOE to, to shift the focus more towards um, multi-omics, proteomics, omics sorts of research? Oh, yeah, I'd say we're, we're kind of already there. I think we're doing that uh, um, in, in uh, maybe not at scale right now, but we're certainly certainly looking at that in some of the programs uh, that we fund. Um, you know, it was just, uh, it was interesting. I was just, um, uh, you, you reminded me of a, of a talk. We just had our PI meeting last week. And so we were all uh, uh, busy talking about some of the, the new research coming out. And I remember one of our, our uh, one of the comments from our keynote address, um, the keynote speaker, was that when we actually go in and looking at um, environmental samples, and we work in soil for the most part, um, that uh, certainly the metagenomics are not capturing the the active community. We're capturing a lot of dead biomass there, and so we're we need some resolution there to figure out what is actively active. Metagen uh, the um, uh, transcriptomics can help, the proteomics can help, um, but we're just now getting to the point where we can actually do that more broader scale in soil. That may help. Um, understand a little bit more of the active community uh, in these systems, um, but it still doesn't make the link to the traits that we might want to look at at a larger scale. Thank you. Good. Um, Janine. Yeah, thanks. So uh, I want to build on this idea of organisms as fundamental units in biological processes and um, go to Woody's comments about uh, this international recognition that's come on the heels of climate change in terms of goals and, bi and targets for global biodiversity framework and GeoBond's efforts to have monitoring systems and, and coming up with ways to actually monitor biological patterns globally and just pose the question when we're considering continental scale biological research needs in this in this uh, report, what are the bottlenecks that you see in integrating large scale pattern data, remote sensing data with biological processes where organisms might justifiably be the, the fundamental units of response and interaction? And our agencies generally interested in in working either towards the monitoring efforts or the t goals and targets themselves of the global biodiversity framework so those are two two questions but they're related thanks janine and were you specifically tossing that to woody or open well so i'm curious Woody, about the bottlenecks for integrating yes. large scale patterns with um, right. biological processes where organisms are units of a process. But I'm also interested in the everyone's view on like the role of agencies in working towards international goals and targets. Yeah, hi, Janine. Thanks. Oops. Yeah, you asked me um, I mean, NASA's been fortunate a little bit on the global side in that so much of our data is global data. And so we sort of had a, a remit to work globally for since we got started. And that helps us think about things like climate and, and biodiversity loss in, in the global. Other agencies may not have that, uh, that history or mandate even. Um, so, But I do think, yeah, I mean, there's, there's clearly an interest in... Um, linking up with our partners overseas. We do it all the time. Other agencies certainly do it as well. Um, that's becoming increasingly important, and not only because we're dealing with global phenomena, just because the expertise is, is truly global and to get the best of something, you all have to go overseas. In terms of what's limiting, again, I'm gonna just go back to what I was saying earlier, and that is I do think our uh, models, 
sort of modeling infrastructure and our, 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 our basic understanding as, as it gets back to scale is still quite limiting. Uh, and so that limits our ability to assemble the models at, to get to the right targets. People were talking about earlier, your target depends on what you're trying to figure out and the target will change depending on what, you know, what your questions are. But we still need to understand how things connect to get to that target. And so there's a modeling piece there which I, I view as sort of a more of a research challenge. And then there's the, the data piece of it, which is more of a technical challenge. But these challenges, these technical and, and research challenges are intertwined. I mean, you can't, you can't do the modeling without better, you know, without better, better data systems. You can't design better data systems without a sense of why you're designing it for what. And so those two are really closely related. Uh, and that's why I, I think, I mean, as I said at NASA, we're still getting out of sort of the mission mindset that made us very much, not only in terms of our, our data systems, but even the, the science teams using the data, very mission oriented. And I think, um, I know other agencies may have different missions, but they generally work along discipline lines and, and getting beyond those discipline lines is, is always challenging uh, because you're trained people to do certain things and they do it and they keep doing it, they do it well, and they just keep doing it. So I love the fact that they're bringing in all these um, socioeconomic economists at, at EPA and elsewhere. I think that's that's one way to sort of broaden the, the pie and get better at. But to me, from a NASA-centric look, I'd say, you know, our, our models have to get better and the data systems have to get better, but they have to do that in tandem. Um, they can't separate them and expect one to make a, a large advance without the other. And then we just have to think across Across systems, but you think across systems for us that means across missions. But for other folks, it may be across uh, systems, or, or be they social or physical or, or something else. Well, I hope that makes sense, Janine. That's where I'm living these days. Thanks, yeah, Wendy. thank you. I, yeah, I do keep thinking about the biology itself. Like, how do we do better at connecting the biology to the patterns we can get from space? That that's all about scale. To me, it's all about scale. Because the, the, the organisms, if you talk about organisms, are generally not filling the pixel uh, by any means. Um, sometimes they're not even visible in the pixel. And so when I started these programs, it was all, I had to convince people that you know we should even be in the game, uh, and was able to do so with help from folks uh, like some of those on this on this panel today in terms of making the case that you can indirect you can directly sense biodiversity or elements of biodiversity, and you can indirectly sense them through models. So that's what. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Scott, you have a question. I do. Thanks everybody for your presentations today. It's been really interesting and informative. Um, my question is somewhat related to Jack's initial question, but I'm, I'm more in a sort of retrospective manner in terms of um, what announcements or programs have you done sort of across agencies, maybe calls for proposals? And I wonder about what lessons learned you might have from those. For, so for example, Woody, I know you in the past have had joint um, calls for proposals <clears throat> with NSF. I forget which program, maybe biocomplexity or something like that. Um, and I, yeah, so I'm mostly curious about how those um, sort of interagency calls have um, fared and if there are any lessons learned from those. Well, I'm glad that Katerina put her hand up so I didn't have to just call on her because I know that she knows a lot about these types of initiatives. Um, yeah, well, so at, um, at NSF, we've um, historically and I think increasingly lately uh, try to really work um, as much as possible in the interagency space, especially if we are kind of rallying around some of the grand challenge problems, like, um, of course, pandemic research, ecology of infectious diseases, um, or um, biodiversity related research and uh, climate change. Um, some of the longstanding programs that we have had, and I've talked a little bit about that, um, is of course the Ecology and Evolution of Infectious Disease uh, Program, which is running now for 20 years, which has had long-term participation from NIH um, and from USDA. 
and also has uh, long-term participation from uh, international agencies such as uh, the UK with UKRI and um, the um, NSFC, uh, National Natural Science Foundation of China and um, NRF in South Africa. Um, we also um, have uh, had the dim Dimensions of Biodiversity uh, uh, program, which worked you know, with international partners. We have several other programs that are being stood up or have been stood up right now that mostly work across an NIH, USDA, DOE. And so um, the, uh, the lessons learned is that um, I find that it's um, always takes a little bit of time to get these programs together, but um, often there is, uh, we, we find um, kind of common ground of uh, our missions. And often um, it's a matter of kind of hashing out what are the connective pieces where each of the agency can kind of work in that particular mission space and connect. And um, what I find in general is that um, the communities that are supported through these uh, interagency missions are, of course, often very vibrant. There's often very interesting research that comes out of uh, those particular efforts. And a lot of this filters also down in what we call our core programs, where you know, we just have novel ideas bubbling up uh, from these interactions. And I mean, my colleagues from other agencies can speak to that. It's it's not, I mean, there is always a level of bureaucracy that has to be kind of uh, worked through. So it's not always uh, a, a nice one-on-one -on -one plug and play kind of situation. But uh, I think in general, uh, my experience has been that we've been pretty good um, to kind of make those connections and make them last as long as we, we can, despite all the, the budget uh, craziness that we always have to deal with. Thanks, Katarina. And um, we're coming up on the end where uh, Jack is gonna sort of wrap things up, but uh, I wonder, Woody, did you have something kind of quick to add? I always got something to add. Thanks, Stephanie. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, we've, did, we've had some great uh, success working with NSF. Um, dimensional biodiversity. I mean, um, Janine and Scott and others have, have gotten uh, benefit. It's been great, great work. Uh, Katrina is exactly right. The bureaucracy can be challenging. Um, it works best if you don't exchange money. You just keep the money on your side of the interface. It also works best if there's some sort of talking about scale. If there's actually scale in terms of the size of the programs involved and what they're able to bring to it, that that also helps. I think for this activity, continental scale, one idea, one thing we could do, which Getting back to its its beginning, NEON was initially uh, not just about sites and airborne transects, but there was going to be a satellite layer on top of it um, to sort of connect the multiple NEON sites and to give you a true, uh, you know, seamless data set, uh, or maybe data sets plural, uh, across across the country with the satellite data. I think we should get back to that, and, and uh, I probably bear a lot of responsibility for us not get, for getting that because I didn't pursue it at the time as, as hard as I should have. But... There's an example where if you really want to do this, this cross-scale integration of, of information and data, getting data sets that are truly national wall-to-wall -to, -wall to bring together with those site data and the airborne platform data uh, is so, so complimentary. So throw that out there, see if it's interesting. That's great, Woody. Thanks. I do remember that. All right. Thanks so much. You're all incredibly busy people and you're doing really important work and we appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. So I'll go ahead and hand it back over to Jack to wrap us up. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Stephanie and all the sp excellent speakers for the great presentation and stimulating uh, discussion. So I will just briefly summarize some of the takeaway message in, uh, that I uh, had in three words starting with the uh, letter C. There are complexity, uh, co uh, cooperation, and capacity building. Uh, complexity, as Simon mentioned in his keynote presentation, the core of uh, uh, sustainability is to try to understand the complexity because the whole world is so complex. And this uh, uh, issue has been uh, touched upon or spoke about uh, by all the speakers, one way or another. 
For example, um, Katharina mentioned that the prediction of the spatial and temporal dynamics is uh, extremely complex. And uh, Scott also mentioned this complex human environment interactions in response to multiple stressors and um, need um, a lot of insight from multiple disciplines. And in terms of collaboration, right, to address those complexity um, problems, we need a lot of collaboration. Simon emphasized that the need and for and the power of collaboration to achieve global sustainability. And uh, Katharina mentioned, you know, give examples about collaboration within agencies uh, for integrated sciences. And actually she mentioned that reintegrated science at much larger scales. And Annika mentioned collaboration and um, um, between agencies. She gave an excellent example about this uh, collaboration between NIH and NSF centers for oceans and human health. And also, um, Woody mentioned bring different sources of data from different sensors and the field work together. And um, through um, platforms and the cl uh, collaborative cloud environment for data processing, analysis, software development, and Scott mentioned, you know, integrated systems approaches. And in terms of capacity, there are many resources, data, tools, methods, and the workforce. For example, Pat mentioned the user facilities and the computational facilities. And Woody mentioned the multi-mission uh, multi algorithms and analysis platform. And um, Katharina and Annika mentioned the importance of training of diverse workforce and for different disciplinary integration and which also require pay more attention to justice and uh, equity issues. So these and many other insights that I could not uh, have time to talk about will really help us to address big and challenging questions in the future. And uh, there are many other wonderful ideas, right? I just don't have time to mention here. But the committee has, and the, um, uh, including myself, has learned so much today and yesterday, uh, but would like to learn more. So we are planning to have the second public information gathering session on June 15th. So everybody is welcome to join that session too. And more detailed information will be posted on the website of the National Academies later. Right? And also I want to thank the excellent keynote speakers yesterday and today, and also the other presenters yesterday and today for their really useful insights and really helpful information and um, very valuable perspectives. And their fantastic job that uh, Louis and Stephanie did in moderating the, moderating the sessions yesterday and today is also greatly appreciated. I'm most grateful to the wonderful committee members and the staff team members of the National Academies including the staff study director, Cliff, and uh, Trisha has been really leading the way in organizing this webinar. And Kat and the many other staff members also have been enormously helpful in many ways. So, so also I'd like to thank the engaged audience for the active participation, including questions and, uh, for, and their feedback and the input to the committee will be really helpful. Again, the input and feedback can be posted on the website of the National Academies or email uh, Cliff. Right. So this is a really remarkable two days. 
So I want to thank you so much, everyone. And I will look forward to see you on June 15th during our second webinar. So enjoy the rest of the day. So thank you so much. Bye-bye.